Thanks very much to uh, the Linux Foundation and to you all for, for having me. I'm going to spend a little bit of time this morning talking about uh, how I came to be interested in this problem. And uh, I'll say up front, rather than triumphing any successes that we've had uh, using open strategies to solve this problem, I'm going to talk about why I believe uh, that these things are still part of the solution, although I think that um, that it's, that it's important to uh, not to claim uh, victory before we've gotten there. In the spring of 2004, I was a graduate student at Duke University and was mobilized as a reservist to go to Iraq. And uh, by mid-August, I was in uh, Anbar province in, in Iraq, uh, serving as a combat engineer platoon commander. Within Five months, um, I had been blown up on New Year's Day of 2005, and I was back in the United States learning about the current state of prosthetic arm technology. And what I found was that the devices that the vast majority of arm amputees use uh, every day was very different from w what you might have expected from the popular press, even at that time. Uh, at the beginning of 2005. And what you see here is the original 1912 patent uh, by a man named D.W. Dorrance for the split prosthetic hook. And uh, the hook, that's a steel hook there, but my favorite is a titanium one that I got at uh, Walter Reed Army Hospital. And despite uh, nearly $200 million of investment by the Department of Defense, um, this remains the most popular prosthetic arm device. And it's actually second to what I'm wearing today, which is nothing. Imagine for a moment if this were true of other devices that you use. Um, and, and you know, I, I, the impact is not reduced by stopping at 09 with the 3G. And uh, this is not the picture that you would get from images in the popular press, some of which I've been involved in, um, which show a very different picture of uh, you know, thought-controlled thought robotic technology. And while these uh, successes are impressive, they have not been translated to the clinic yet. Um, just as an analogy, here's something that you guys may be familiar with, um, perhaps a little closer to your world, is the um, chat bot that supposedly passed the Turing test earlier this year. And these are some of the headlines. Seems like the Brits were more guilty than the rest of us here when I was looking um, for these. And here's the reality. Yahoo engaged the chat bot, and this is what they got. And um, you know, the short answer is no, the thing hasn't passed the Turing test. I wonder, actually, is the, the way they got around it was by claiming that it was a 13-year-old Ukrainian non-native speaker. And I wonder if they had asked him in Ukrainian about current events if they would have gotten even stupider answers. Um, so, you know, what we're talking about in prosthetic arms is dexterity and manipulation. And these words are bandied about kind of casually. Uh, and in fact, the current state of things, even in high-tech robotics, is not solving the Rubik's Cube. It's uh, just not dropping it. Now, why is this? Um, it's because the population, the patient population is so small. We, the market is simply not there. Venture capitalists are not going to get excited about a $100 million market for prosthetic arms in comparison to uh, billions and billions of dollars for uh, markets like video games and ED drugs. And the amount of money that we spend on R&D is correspondingly small and you know, justifiably so. Although this, these projects have been compared to the moonshot, um, nothing approaches the more than $100 billion that we spent to get to the moon. So what we're talking about is public interest design. This is design of things that our society needs uh, that we're not doing a very good job at providing, mostly because the markets are small, either because uh, even if they're large, they're disadvantaged, um, or even if advantaged are very small, like perhaps some of the um, uh, upper limb prosthetic patients in the US. There are fewer than 50,000 uh, people like me missing at least part of an arm in the United States, and nothing like that is going to get a venture capitalist excited. So how can we solve this problem? These are all projects that people agree that we ought to be working on, and there's a lot of interest in them, but there's generally no money. Um, so obviously, government remains part of the solution. I think we could probably do a better job of what happens to our money when we spend it uh, on, on projects like this. 
uh, DIY and open source, I still believe, are part of the solution, although they're, um, you know, they're messy and sometimes ineffective tools. Um, but, but sometimes scratching your own itch is really uh, the, the best way to get something. And so I'm gonna, that's basically what I'm going to talk about today. I still believe that there's the possibility for uh, an orphan device law. I borrowed this phrase from um, orphan drugs, which the FDA defines as uh, targeted at a patient population of fewer than 250,000. And we certainly have this and many other. The, the NIH lists more than 6,000 medical conditions um, that it describes as orphans on its website. And in fact, mine, lib limb absence, is not even one of them. So that gives you an indication of um, you know, perhaps uh, how many people in the aggregate that we're talking about here. Um, I think we could do a better job in regulation and policy, perhaps by enforcing uh, open source, the Baidol Marchin um, provisions in the intellectual property generated by the government and others, and I can talk to any of you if you're interested offline. And then finally, creativity and industry. Um, if any of you know anybody at Google, please tell them that we'd love for one of the eight robotic uh, businesses that they, require, they acquired over the last year uh, to solve my problem on the way to delivering us Rosie the Robot uh, maids or whatever it is that they're planning on doing with those things. Um, here's a little project that, that I did that maybe is a good example of some of the difficulties in doing this. Um, the harness that goes with that arm that I showed you uh, that basically allows you to pull your opposite shoulder and, um, and actuate the hook open and closed um, often results in uh, nerve damage by pressure up under the armpit. Um, it smells bad and there are a bunch of other uh, problems which I, a lot of which I solved and I will not, I have not worn a regular harness, I've worn these for several years now. But uh, despite the fact that we published the design uh, on the internet, um, this hasn't been adopted by the industry and the basic reason is that it reimburses for, uh, you know, between 100 and 160 dollars and the design that I made adds a $25 shirt to the cost of making uh, that product and um, you know when you already have a bunch of you know unhappy customers for the standard thing without it why would you change <laughs> and uh, and so so this is this gets to one of the problems in hardware which uh, you know wh which is the fact that when you when you're dealing with physical things cost is very much more present than it is uh, in software where the marginal cost of distribution is you know close to zero um, we do have a functional open source project up. Um, uh, this is uh, hardware, firmware, uh, and software, uh, although our user base is very, very small. It basically consists of two labs, one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast, and uh, it relies on um, MATLAB, uh, something like $20,000 worth of toolboxes in MATLAB, so the barriers to to participating in this despite the fact that our code is open source are still quite high. And so uh, actually one of the things we're excited about is because of publicity for this event, um, we already have a volunteer who's talking about helping us port um, that MATLAB code to um, you know, perhaps something like Java so we might be able to make it uh, a developer app available on Android. Uh, anyway, I invite any of you to check this out if you'd like to help. Um, the, the uh, previous talk mentioned um, some of these things, 3D printed hands. Um, I, I would offer a, uh, you know, a very measured um, evaluation of it um, by saying that, first of all, I think that, that uh, a lot of the publicity surrounding this has been, in fact, generated by 3D printing companies. And I haven't found a lot of incident instances of truly uh, iterative use and development of this. And actually, I had a, a significant amount of difficulty finding. Uh, you can find the build files, um, but actually finding CAD source files to usefully manipulate these things um, yourself was very challenging. Uh, most of what I found were, you know, uh, puff pieces in the media talking about how great this was, and I couldn't find a link to a SolidWorks file. Um, the, the other thing is that most of these designs are hand-based, um, in contrast to the very widely used hook that, that, that I showed. And you can see that as, you know, even ABS plastic, their durability um, is, is nowhere close to what a uh, titanium steel or aluminum hook is. Um, the one in the upper left there is actually a wood, deer hide, and metal spring 
design from 1935. Um, and that's available for close to the cost of what these 3D printed ones are. And uh, it's in fact what I use um, to ride my bike. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I would say, you know, before we look at moving to, um, you know, to some of these other things, the, the benefit uh, really has to be there. Um, so these are logos that represent a bunch of the different ways that people have chosen to try and share uh, open hardware. Um, some of them never went uh, very far at all. The Ohanda one in the upper left. Uh, the open source hardware folks spent some time arguing about the logo and the copyright uh, associated with the logo that it is similar to. Um, people have used the GPL and Creative Commons licenses to try to license the uh, representations of hardware. Um, the one in the lower right is the Tucson Amateur Packet Radio license, which has some very weird provisions that um, require whoever uh, uses it to actually indemnify uh, somebody else for potential liability associated with the use of it. And, and, and the, the short story is that we have some uh, legal challenges associated with what it actually is anybody is even licensing when they're talking about hardware. Um, and we saw some of these examples today. You know, in the upper left, uh, I think you've seen in uh, the, the MakerBot ecosystem a development from uh, an open design, a challenge from another clone in the TangiBot that failed, and, and MakerBot has gone closed with uh, a lot of their design. Um, in their defense, I didn't buy one until they changed the product <laughs> so, that, so that it was uh, useful enough, and, and that apparently took investment that forced them to, to go that route. So, um, you know, there, there are challenges here. Arduino in the upper right. Um, the free Duino is the little board to the right there. Uh, even though Arduino shared everything, they similarly complained about the existence of a clone, although the proliferation of those, um, in my view, makes the Arduino as valuable as it is. Um, and and, uh, and so, so these tensions are, are part of this problem. Lower left, local motors, you guys heard from, from those guys earlier this week. Um, they share their design, you know, they, they called out Tesla, I'll go ahead and call them out here even though uh, their CEO is a fellow Marine. Uh, they share everything uh, Creative Commons uh, non-commercial. So, you know, and I would argue that what they're licensing, um, you know, isn't actually the ideas behind the designs, it's the design itself. So if you were to use the same design, there's no way they could nail you anyway. Um, so that's one of the challenges. Lower right, Aerolab designed a Formula One car for these folks, and uh, they had a dispute um, over intellectual property. The, the uh, uh, India Formula One car won uh, $20,000, uh, but then they had to pay uh, Aerolab the more than 700,000 that they owed them. <laughs> so sort of a Pyrrhic, Pyrrhic victory. Anyway, the, the, the legal stuff behind open hardware is um, not at all settled, and so those are the problems. The problem is that a physical design, except for a circuit board layout, a very special circumstance, which is protected by copyright, is unprotectable unless you patent it. So all these people who are talking about licenses for open hardware, uh, all they are talking about licensing is the copyright on the particular instance of the physical design, and the ideas behind it are unprotectable unless they have a patent. Um, so, and physical things are harder to make and they cost money. Um, I have two solutions to these. One, uh, patent it and then license it and then figure out how to way, a way to make it viral and that's a challenge because why would anybody pay to protect further changes if they're themselves not going to benefit? Um, you could have a foundation that could fund that, I don't know, others, other possibles. But uh, the other one that I wanted to present to this crowd because nobody else has gotten it any other time I've talked about it is that if you were to construct a piece of software um, that similar to open source uh, software required a creation of a copy of this thing in the RAM in order to usefully use it, then you could perhaps transfer the copyright basis of open source software to hardware. In other words, if the only way to look at it and use it was to agree to a license and use this particular software, uh, then we might be able to achieve the same thing. And then you could have a zero cost way to create a, a viral open source license. So anyway, I'd like to talk to anybody, if you, any of you who might be interested in that um, later. And then 
Uh, finally, I wanted to uh, speak to the specific things. If there are people here who would be interested in, in helping us with our efforts, because as I've said, we've had um, you know, probably more publicity than we deserve because of the idea of applying open source to this and our successes really remain um, to be had. We are trying to create a new website, a private foundation is gonna significantly fund us to create a, um, a website that uses the Vivo semantic tools to try to better organize information. And right, right now we have about five different websites um, each of which do some particular things badly and no one place to um, really organize this community. And so we're gonna actually get a chance to, uh, to develop that. And we have a spec document at the link that's up there um, to inform this development and we'd love comment on it. And if anyone wants to help with development, we'd certainly like to have that. Um, I already mentioned porting the um, MyOpen MiniV code. Um, and that, that project is, is referenced there. We're also uh, going to create a uh, Kickstarter project to create the next generation, a true useful developer kit uh, of that hardware device that we have there to the uh, problems and barriers to entry in hardware, despite the fact that we've had that design up for several years now, as far as I know, no one outside of those two academic labs that I've mentioned has actually built one um, because it's like a, it's a six layer board with really tiny vias and O4 components. And um, you know, uh, uh, Tim Hansen who designed the board and you know, I, I helped him build it in a toaster oven, um, but it's really not the kind of thing that you know, we, we would expect your average hobbyist, hobbyist to be able to do. I certainly wouldn't have had anything to do with it without um, Tim's help. Um, so what we'd really, really like to do is try to lower the barriers to entry to engaging with that hardware and software, and, and maybe a next generation device can help us do that. Um, and certainly be open to, to, to anything else, but, but I think those are the things that probably would appeal to uh, the kinds of interest that we have uh, here in this crowd. And uh, that pretty much concludes my, my remarks. I finished a little bit faster than I intended to. I'm sure the, uh, that the, uh, the organizer will, organizers will appreciate my helping everybody catch up. But so I will be here, um, actually because of scheduling, I will be here tonight. So I, I would certainly love to talk about any of the things that, uh, that I mentioned in this talk um, this afternoon or, or this evening. So please find me and, and thanks very much again for having me.